once again, it's a beautiful day and it's good to be here with you. And I'd like to just uh, acknowledge that you are pursuing and pressing on and pressing in. Every time you listen and the preaching of the word, every time you seek her and to encounter him, you are not left alone. God will meet you where you are. And today we will have a wonderful time as we enter into more of the truth that will set us free. So let us pray. Today, Father, we acknowledge that we are part of your plan. You have given us a purpose. You have predestined us, O oh God, to a place where it will be so good, will be so wonderful, and that it will be bring fulfillment into our lives. We want, O oh God, to be there. We agree with you that it is the best thing that can ever happen to us. And so thus, anoint us, equip us, and uh, open up our eyes, Lord. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. We have a message uh, entitled, The Power of Worship. In John chapter 12, verse 32, it says, And I, and this Jesus talking, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Wow. Now, this is pertaining to worship. This is pertaining to honoring the Lord, exalting him, magnifying him. Now, when we talk about worship, there are two profound elements of worship. First is celebration, and the next is proclamation. Worship is a proclamation. It's a celebration, rather. A celebration to be experienced, not just to... to um, to undergo and to and to just and to just go through another uh, activity, but it should be an encounter. It should be a wonderful experience with God, with the Lord, and then it should also be a celebration to be shared, not just to keep it for ourselves, but we want to share it. The message this morning is about the hearer of the power of worship to the unbelieving word. Wow, the power of worship to the hearer and to an unbelieving world. In Psalm 40, verse 3, it says, And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Well, the two elements of worship. From this verse, we see profound elements of worship, celebration and proclamation. The celebration is the vertical dimension of worship. David had an experience with God. God rescued him. God refreshed him. David had an experience. David experienced the presence of God. And it changed him. And because of that, he couldn't be silent about it. He sang praise to God. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God, according to Psalm 40, verse 3. David was exuberant in song and praise. He put his heart into it. He put his all into it. He was excited. He could not contain his joy. If it were you, when you encounter God, you could not contain your joy. You couldn't contain your happiness and you are relieved of all your troubles. This was exuberance in songs and praise. Now, David, because of that, it changed him. He had to shout and sing. Wow. All of the psalms were designed to be sung. The book of Psalms. Singing is an important spiritual expression. Singing is mentioned explicitly some 68 times in the book of Psalms. No wonder the, the, the man, Lou Longfellow, called the human voice the organ of the soul. Can you imagine it? Our voice is the organ of the soul. And it wasn't just any song that David sang. David sang a new song, something new, something more powerful. There was freshness. There was newness to experience with God. So it was always a new song. Every encounter with God was as if it's the first time. It was though he was seeing God again for the first time. Wow. 
because God has many facets. We can see God in, in, in so many ways. Now, the singing was praiseful. It was worship. Wow. So David was expressing a song of gratitude to God for who he is, for what he said, and what God has done. David knew that the source of good fortune was none other than God himself, no one else. So the next uh, aspect of uh, worship is the proclamation. This is the horizontal dimension. First, it was the vertical towards God. Now the horizontal dimension toward its other. David said, many will see, that is to know God's presence and fear or revere and be awed by him and put their trust or find security in the Lord, in the Lord our God. So as David praised God, many saw him, many saw the way he praised God. They did not merely hear his praise. They saw David praising God. And in turn, the same security that David found in God, they too, those who observed David, they too would find that security and join David in worship. David's joy before the Lord was his witness. Wow. What was that? His joy in the Lord before the Lord. It was a witness to the people who were observing him. Now, we don't just worship at church. Worship, actually, is a constant attitude and activity of our lives. When the church gathers to worship, it also gathers to witness. Worship always includes witness. Oh, we are witnesses of the Lord, right? When people far from God Hear this, those people who are close to God giving heartfelt praise and heartfelt worship to God. They are intrigued. They are curious. The questions they ask, how does this happen? Why does this happen? The sparks of fire in our worship ignites dry hearts, causing them to sing a new song and praise to God. Wow. The two products of worship. What can we learn from Psalm 40 verse 3? Throughout the Bible, there is a close, vibrant relationship between worship and witness. It reflected two ways. First, people from far from God are drawn to Christ through worship. Wow. Worship draws people to the Lord. Whoa, they can encounter him. And people who are close to God are compelled to share Christ after worship. Wow. People are drawn to him and people who are already drawn to him are compelled to share Christ after the worship service or after worshiping. Now, it can be diagrammed in the following manner. Wow. Let's see. Well, it can be diagrammed in the following manner. There's a, an arrow, then worship, then arrow. A spiritually lost people are drawn to Christ through worship. And this arrow uh, represents people who are drawn to Christ in worship. This is reflected by the above diagram. The arrow on the left side of worship. Worship attracts. Like a magnet, it draws people to God. Wow. Can you imagine that? So, Paul said to the Corinthian church, worship in such a way that if an unbeliever entered, he is convicted by all and is judged by all. 
The secrets according 1 Corinthians 14, verses 24 and 25. The secrets of his heart will be revealed. And as a result, he will fall face down and worship God, proclaiming, God is really among you. You know what? It's because that person encountered God. The secrets of his heart was revealed and he will fall face down, worship God because he encounters God. He feels, he felt the presence of God. He knows that God is there touching him, touching his heart. Now Jesus stated in John 12, 32, as for me, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw people to myself. Wow. When Jesus is lifted up in worship, in a worship service, it will draw people to him. While the words of Jesus predicted his death, it also communicates so, so much in our worship. When Jesus is lifted up in praise and worship, lost people are attracted to him. That's why we encourage people, bring your friends, bring your relatives, bring your office mates to the worship service because in the worship service, they can encounter God without even preaching to them. Just the presence of God will touch them and they will be attracted and drawn to God himself. David cited the evangelistic attraction of honest worship. Wow. Honest worship. Psalm 57 verse 9. I will praise you, Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. So when God's people experience the presence of God, when we meet God and we engage his heart, lives are changed. And consequently, lost people are drawn into God's presence as well. Wow, people cannot help it. The unbeliever wants what the believer has. You bring your friend, you bring your relative, you bring your office mate to the worship service. When they see what's happening in your life, when they see what's, what the people are being going through, they would want what we have. The world sits up and then it takes notice. There's a man called William Booth. His name is William Booth. He's the founder of the Salvation Army. And he used to say, if a church was on fire for God, people for miles would come to watch it burn. Well, to paraphrase what Booth said, if believers experience the fire of God's worship, then lost people would be drawn to God like a moth to the flames. Can you just imagine that? So the Bible teaches over and over again that God would draw seekers to himself through authentic worship by his people. More people are won to Christ by feeling God's presence than all our apologetic and evangelistic argument combined. Few people, any, are converted to Christ on purely intellectual grounds. The sense of God's presence melts hearts and explodes mental barriers. So think with me for a moment. When the churches had revivals, in the beginning, the protracted meetings in the revivals were designed to inspire the believers while impacting the spiritually lost. Many of these meetings were great times of singing, giving out testimonies, and the preaching of the word. And people were drawn to the exuberance worship. Wow, powerful worship. The authenticity, authenticity of the people, not fake ones, but the authenticity of true Christians and the power of the preacher. Time and time again, lost, the lost, the morally, morally corrupt, the wicked people would come to the altar when the preacher finished his sermon and they give their hearts to Jesus. Now, seekers may not understand all that happens in a house of worship you know, because it's brand new to them. 
they may not understand the meaning of a song or the significance of the communion, but they know joy when they see it. They know when lives are impacted. They know when lives are touched. They can read when lives are changed. And when they do, they want to, they want to have what those people have. But the opposite is also true. What happens when a spiritually distant person sees boredom in the faces of the people in church? What if they see angry and bad tempered expressions in the faces of the people in church? You see, they see the people yawn or uh, text with their cell phone or play games with their cell phone. Question. Will they be attracted to Christ? I think not. Spiritually saved people are sent out to share Christ after worship. Though worship lost people are drawn to Christ, and at the same time, believers feel the tug and the urge and the compelling force of God to tell others about him. In the diagram, let's see. Okay. In the diagram below, this compelling force is the arrow right side of worship. In the left side, the arrow brings people and draws them to Christ, and they encounter him in worship. And after worship, people who felt encounter of God, there is a compelling force in the arrow on the right side of worship to go and tell others about God. Wow. A quick review of the Bible will reveal a correlation between people who are encountering God through worship and the effect that it has on the lives as they went out to share Christ. Biblical examples of this happening is in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. <clears throat> it says, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, and his robe filled the temple. My eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who should I send? Who will go for us? I said, Here am I, send me. This is Isaiah 61, verse 1, 5, and 8. So Isaiah was commissioned to go and speak to his people. Only after he saw the Lord in worship, he encountered the Lord in worship. Isaiah saw, he heard, and he responded. If he had not entered into worship, he could have missed the calling of God in his life. So church, as you worship God in a worship service, you can, you might get the call of God in the midst of worship. You might know what you are supposed to do, where you are supposed to be, what you are supposed to say, and the Lord will reveal it even in the midst of worship. The 11 disciples that traveled to the Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them, when they saw Jesus, they worshiped, and some doubted, of course, then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always 
to the end of the age. The Great Commission is the heartbeat of the church, by the way. It informs individual believers and the church to go and tell others about Jesus. The context of this command was given in a worship encounter. The Great Commission was following a time, was given following a time of worship. The disciples saw Jesus, they worshiped him. It was in this context of worship that they received God's clear call to go to the entire world and represent Jesus. So one day, of the Pentecost, it was a sound of eternal worship that invaded the upper room. You know, Luke described the sound like that of a rushing wind. That awesome and beautiful sound was heard by God-fearing Jews from every nation who thought, oh, these early disciples were drunk. But they were speaking the magnificent acts of God. They were speaking in tongues, but they were speaking the magnificent acts of God. You could say that those 120 disciples were singing a new song. Wow, something new. Something they never had experienced before. And the result was that disciples worshipped. The people heard and saw it and they came to faith in Christ. One fact will stand out. Those early Christians were evangelized almost by accident. It was not intentional. Evangelism sprang from their worship, the 120 of them, when they were declaring the wonderful, magnificent acts of God. Their worship witnessed to the awesome display of God's presence and power. Oh, the presence of God was so thick and you can almost touch it and feel it. Now the unbelievers were drawn to Christ through the worship of this 120. And in turn, their worship compelled them to tell others about him, about the Lord. Now, those wholehearted worshipers called the whole world to wholehearted worship. Wow. They went out. And the whole world was drawn into a wholehearted worship. You could describe the relationship like this. If you truly meet God, you will worship. If you truly worship, others will be drawn to God. As you are drawn to God, you are compelled to witness for Christ. There are two challenges for the worshiper. First is, come to celebrate. Lay aside your troubles your anxieties and your fears and your cares. Celebrate God's gift of mercy and grace. God's touch and forgiveness. God's power to lift out the slimy pits, lift you out of the slimy pits of life. God's provision to set you on firm footing. Sing a new song. Wow, that comes with a new experience in the Lord. Sing a hymn of praise. Now, the arrow on the left of worship is what is, is re, it represents those who are drawn to the Lord to worship because of the worship. Tell others about your experience. Worshippers don't just enjoy God's wonderful presence for themselves. Invite people to join you at worship. Bring your friends, bring your relatives, bring your bring, bring your office mates, bring in the people that God uh, brings into your life. Call others to join you on the mountaintop of worship, to come into God's presence. Yes, God's presence. Encounter Him to stand before God's throne. This is represented by the arrow on the right of worship. Oh, to go out and bring others to the place of worship. Now, where are you on the diagram? Are you on the left side of worship? Are you being drawn to Christ? That's great. You are a worshiper. Well, God does not need your worship. God 
truly delights in what you do as you worship him. If you are on the left side and have not accepted Christ at some point, you need to cross the line of faith and accept Christ into your heart. Do it today. Now let us conclude. Are you on the right side of the word worship? Are you telling others about Christ? Are you inviting others into the presence of God? God wants you to live on both sides of the word worship. On the left side, you are drawn to him. You are to worship him. But God doesn't want you to stay there on the left side forever. <clears throat> he sends us out. The only, to only stay at the left side is to disobey God. God wants us to worship, but he also wants us to witness. Man named, <coughs> excuse me, Garrett Gustafson said it best. He said, Worship is the goal of evangelism. And evangelism is the fruit of worship. Wow. Worship, the goal of evangelism. And evangelism is the fruit of worship. Just as one experiences God, <clears throat> they want to tell others about God. So be a worshiper but also be a witness for God. Be drawn into God's holy presence, but also be one sent out into the world to bring others into worship and into the Lord our God. Let us pray. Father, we ask that even in our own moments at home or in the office or along the road, may our worship truly be exuberant, that people around us, Father, and even in the church, when we invite our friends, relatives, and office mates, that they will see and encounter the Lord, and they will be drawn and attracted to worship Him. Father, even as the people in the church worship you, we ask that we will be compelled, as you touch us, that we will be compelled to tell others about you, that the power of worship is about attracting people and sending people to, to, to invite people. Oh God, this is the lifestyle of the kingdom. And we want this lifestyle to be so real in each of our lives, even today. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and mercy. This we pray, oh God, in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Hallelujah. God loves you and have a powerful week ahead. God is good. Enjoy your worship and draw people to the Lord as you worship and tell more people about God. Take care and have a good day. God is good. <laughs>